Welcome to everyone joining us for our talk today titled Beyond the Statistics, Finding the Real Story Beyond Gender, Behind Gender Data. My name is Bianchi. Today, my colleagues, Afira and I, will be presenting on how the team at Continentalist applies a gender lens to data storytelling and why this is crucial in any area working with data. For those of you who haven't heard of us yet, let's start with a quick introduction. We come from Continentalist, a Singapore-based data visualization storytelling outfit. We aim to bring data to the forefront of global conversations. We cover topics in Asia and about Asia, ranging from gender, culture, history, climate change, the environment, sustainable development, and the economy. We do this through data visualization, data storytelling, editorial work, and information design. Our team works together through three key areas, editorial, design, and development. Together, we make data stories. But first of all, why stories? Storytelling has earned its place as one of the most important human traditions. The best lessons in life are transmitted through stories. They leave more impact. Stories, put simply, stick. Through data storytelling, Continentalist focuses on centering the Asian experience. And every time we use data, we consider its context and the people behind the numbers before using it. Now, in the next section, Zafira will speak about how this specifically applies to the intersection of gender and data. Thank you, Bianchi. So before we get into the nitty gritty of how we can apply a gender lens to data work, it's important for all of us to understand why this conversation around data and gender is crucial in the first place. How our lives have been subconsciously colored by certain biases and how this affects the data we collect. To do this, I'd like us to take a few steps back. Let's look at how women have been viewed throughout history. The way we've understood human evolution and development has often been from the perspective of hunting animals, mostly known as a male activity but where does this leave women's experiences? In 1966, an academic group on hunter-gatherer societies called Men the Hunter contemplated the importance of hunting for human evolution and development. There was little talk of women's roles in gathering, cooking, and caring for children. It seemed like women's contributions, labor, and overall personhood were conveniently forgotten in its place, an overt focus on men's desire to hunt and kill for survival. A few years later, researchers further found that ancient cave paintings were actually drawn by women. This disputed a previous assumption that the paintings were done by men because they depicted the hunting of game animals. Now let's fast forward to another example of women's exclusion from the historical record. Women have been historically underrepresented in the art world, but when they do count, they're often depicted in the nude. In this poster made by the activist, uh, art, activist artist girl group, Guerrilla Girls, they question the lack of representation of female artists in the modern art section of the New York Metropolitan Museum. This is in contrast to the numerous female nudes done by male artists showcased at the Met. In the next section, Bianchi will talk about how data science and data-driven decision-making are not exempt from these biases and how this leads to disproportionate and often devastating consequences for women. So, is data ever truly objective? First, let's look at the, some definitions. Which one do you think matches best? Is data A, the numbers and categories around which we base statistics? Or is data B, a resource we derive insights from? But let's keep in mind that like sand, we need to process data first before we can get something useful, like glass. And we need to keep in mind that processing this data affects the end product. Or C, does data present the truth? We've seen all too well how data can be misused to lie in recent years. So maybe data can be used to present an alternative reality? Or D, is data simply observations to support an agenda? It's worth noting that the word data dates back to the mid 17th century 
when it was introduced to supplement existing words like evidence and fact. This was towards a rhetorical purpose, the conversion of otherwise debatable info into the solid basis for subsequent claims. So for the purposes of this talk, all we can really say is that data are observations. In some cases, they can help us uncover patterns we can take action on, but the way that they're collected and processed is usually towards supporting some agenda. And all data collection and use of data has some end product in mind. We see this pretty well in the examples of who collects large amounts of data today. Many of us are on social media platforms or use services provided by Google, Apple, Amazon, or other technology giants. These tech companies collect data to understand your behavior so that they can nudge you to buy or sell or use their platform more. Governments also collect data about us to provide better services and to understand socioeconomic problems at the root. These powerful organizations know so much about us. They use data to make decisions about what products and services to offer. And so do you as development practitioners and as policymakers. And just like them, you don't want to make decisions on faulty assumptions or data. But finding good data to make decisions with is easier said than done. Data collection also takes time, money, and human effort to perform. There is a cost to collect data. So we assume defaults to minimize these costs. But what are these defaults? Data is never generated in a void. And even in seemingly objective fields like machine learning, data collection can become biased. Joy Boalamwini, a researcher at the MIT Media Lab and a digital activist, showed how training facial recognition technology on a data set primarily made of photos of people with white skin leads the algorithm to not recognizing people, particularly women with darker skin, as human faces. Another study by the Pew Research Center found that six out of eight gender recognition models were better at identifying men than women. These two examples show how failing to consider the nuances of data collection parameters can lead to real world discrimination. So it's not just facial recognition technology where data has played a role in promoting bias. When we consider all the ways in which a lack of thought about gender in data collection can lead to real world consequences, we end up with a long list of how modern systems have inconvenienced or even failed women. From everyday problems like a too cold office to more insidious and large scale issues like employment inequality and city planning, we see that the data sets that form the basis of these current systems often don't account for gender. In short, many modern systems are built on data that doesn't take into account the differences between the lives of men and women, leaving an entire half of humanity inconvenienced, underserved, and in some cases, invisible. It's high time we change that. What happens when we start to collect data with gender in mind or disaggregate existing data by sex? When we do this, it helps challenge what is assumed to be objective. Gender data starts a conversation around the things that need to change in order to advance gender equality. Filling critical data gaps that exist as a result of gender bias also directly supports evidence-based evidence policymaking and paves the way towards transformative change for women. But what does gender data look like exactly? And what can it do for us? It could be data that uses sex as a primary, primary classification, so simply disaggregating data by male and female. It could also be data that reflects gender issues, such as access to public nursing rooms or cases of gender-based violence. Gender data also includes data that captures the diversity of men and women's lived realities. It considers intersecting inequalities and moves beyond traditional silos of what are women's issues. And it can also refer to data that is collected through methods that account for stereotypes and sociocultural factors that may lead to gender bias. Here, here are two examples of how gender data looks like and how they can be used to tell stories that are underreported or might not have been told otherwise. 
The visualization on the left is from a story on dowry harassment in India, where each dot represents a woman in Delhi who has filed a case of harassment from, from, a, from a partner. On the right-hand side, an article by Reporting Elections looks into the differences between male and female legislators in Pakistan when it comes to passing bills and participation in new legislation. So now we have a better understanding of what gender data is. What can it do? Gender data can challenge the male default and long-standing assumptions on who and what counts and who does the counting. It can also highlight more nuanced, useful, and revealing insights that can be potentially life-saving, especially in the case of women's health and safety. For example, crash test dummies are still mainly designed based on the male body. The use of female crash test dummies remains rare, even though there's increasing awareness that male and female bodies suffer vastly different injuries in car crashes. And while existing data shows that the majority of Americans killed or injured in accidents are male, it hides the fact that females, females face a higher risk of death or injury when an accident occurs. Gender data also helps us understand how to better support each gender given their unique characteristics. For instance, have we ever thought about the extra invisible costs that women bear because of menstruation? Pads and other menstrual products are, are an expensive consumer good, especially when you consider that women menstruate for close to 40 years. Coupled with the lack of support for subsidizing menstrual amenities, it actually costs women and the state a lot of money. Gender data can capture the ways in which women and, women and men live, live and behave differently. Let's take spending patterns in underprivileged communities, for example. Women and men spend differently when given microloans, with the former typically spending on children, groceries, and other household management costs. We also know that unpaid labor in the form of domestic and care work is unequally divided between men and women, affecting women's mental well being and opportunities for work. But gender data is not just about women or for women. Gender revolutionary methods of approaching data were coined in the title of the book, Data Feminism, by authors Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein. It's important to recognize that gender data or data feminism does not only serve women. Advancing gender equality and eliminate, eliminating bias from the current system requires data that takes into account the needs and lived realities across all genders. In the next section, Bianchi will be sharing some of the challenges that we at Continentalists have faced while collecting gender data or working on gender-centric stories. So aside from gender not even being considered in initial data collection, we've faced three other common issues in collecting and applying gender disaggregated data. And we'll list them out here. One is about data accessibility. Two, is about how the vast multitude of decisions about women are made on women's behalf rather than involving women's perspectives. And three is about how issues surrounding women's bodies are considered taboo. Let's go through each of these in more detail. We'll also show and talk about how these have cropped up in Continentalist's work. Later on, Zafira will talk more about how we solve them. Issue one data access and availability. For our She Loves Tech story on female participation in the startup industry, there was very little publicly available sex disaggregated data on funding received by women-led startup companies. Although we know that women face far more obstacles in accessing startup funding and participating in paid employment, for some reason, this data hasn't been collected globally or made publicly available to understand the full scale of the problem. We faced similar issues in our story on sex trafficking. Initially, we based our analysis on data from the, count, from the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative. We centered our analysis on female victims, but even after refraining from filtering further based on sexual assault, we only found a thousand cases. We knew we needed to dig deeper. As many cases go unreported, and the ones captured in the data set were just a small fraction of a wider problem. 
It's worth noting that available statistics are often underreported because of the sensitivity of victim data and the elusiveness and complexity of global trafficking networks. Furthermore, the countries many victims are from do not have robust legislation or comprehensive enforcement to combat sex trafficking. The next issue, number two, is one I feel many women in the audience have encountered. Has it crossed your mind, maybe once, twice, maybe even often, that decisions about women's welfare, health, employment are often made on our behalf, not by other women? How often do we actually get a say? Think about the birth control pill, for example. Some or even most women would have preferred not to menstruate at all. And research has increasingly showed that it's actually safe to skip periods. But because the original designer of birth control was a devout Catholic who wanted to please the Pope, it was designed to still keep the seven days of menstruation, resulting in the continued discomfort of millions of women. And what about religion? Who dictates how women are allowed to practice their faith? Should women's ability to enter public spaces or religious spaces and practice their religion be determined by men? Let's look at the case of the Sabarimala temple in India. Until 2018, women of childbearing age had been barred from entering the temple on the grounds that menstrual blood defiles its sacredness. This is just one of the many challenges that women face with their participation in religion. It is not unique to India, and it happens all across Asia. In short, women rarely get to dictate the direction of policy or product development that is supposed to be centered around them. Assumptions get made about what women need, and data is left uncollected on the pain points or true needs and wants of women. And what about issues that directly affect women's bodies, but are seen as taboo and therefore not right for public discussion? As Nikita Azad, an Indian student activist, wrote in her second open letter, the stigma around speaking openly about menstruation has led to perilous conditions for less educated women. We see more of the same stigmatization in conversations around abortion, pregnancy, childbirth, and even breastfeeding. Although these natural processes should be supported as part of basic health care and should be normalized, many people still don't want to talk about them. And the silence of others makes it hard for a conversation to start around these topics and what issues still remain. This translates to less desire to collect relevant data to solve issues surrounding them. So it's a long list of challenges. Where do we begin and how do we begin to overcome them? In the next section, Zafira will share how continentalists and other practitioners have worked to solve them and to bring light and attention to them. Indeed, the gender data gap has made researching and collecting data on women challenging, but it hasn't stopped us from telling rich and nuanced stories that give some insight into the diversity of women's lived realities and may help us advance gender equality. So now we'll be sharing some tips and tools we've learned from working on these stories and key ideas we've picked up from others who share our mission to reflect gender experiences, fill in the data gaps and eliminate systemic bias. So one is to gather your own counter data. Secondly, to think intersectionally. Three, contextualize your data. Four is to expand what we consider data. And five is to seek nuance through qualitative data. Now let's go through each of these in detail. Firstly, we know that gender disaggregated data is hard to come by for so many reasons. So what do we do in the absence of data? In many instances, we collected our own, what we like to call counter data. For a story in collaboration with Women Unbounded, we visualized data that the nonprofit group manually collected from publicly available news reports by major news outlets. Here, the data clearly debunks arguments that place the blame on female victims' choices, as sexual violence is shown to happen in ways, places, and relationships that women can't avoid, and at very young ages where personal agency is limited. Female choice is not the problem. Male sexual aggression is. Similarly, we gather our own data for a story on sex trafficking in Asia. 
where we manually collected news articles on sex trafficking from each country in the ASEAN region. This allowed us to see trends and led us to investigate why so many from the Mekong region were being trafficked as young brides. In another part of the world, an inspirational woman named Maria Salguero has built a nationwide map tracking femicide cases in Mexico City. In the face of missing data and institutional neglect, Maria monitored daily Google alerts on words related to femicide and reviewed the crime pages of Mexican newspapers Mexican newspapers throughout the, throughout the state. To date, she has logged more than 6,000 cases of femicide since 2016, filling the gaps left by official data on gender-related killings. Another key way to approach gender issues is to think intersectionally when working with data. Intersectionality has indeed become a sort of buzzword in the women's movement over the years but its importance cannot be stressed enough. But first, what is intersectionality actually? Intersectionality can be defined as the systemic study of ways in which social categories such as race, gender, sexuality, class, ethnicity, and other sociopolitical and cultural identities interrelate and overlap. Applying an intersectional lens to our work allows us to see that individual women's lived realities can be unique from one another and have different layers of oppression. Why is this important? Without an intersectional lens, our efforts to address inequalities faced by women might end up perpetuating the same systems that started it. This happens when we ignore how women from a certain class or race suffer from more discrimination in many situations. These patterns are typically less immediately visible due to compounding biases. Currently, we see a lot of intersectional work being on women's equality being done in the US. As we can see in this beautiful knitted data visualization, further, further disaggregating data on women by race reveals that Black, Asian and Latina women are disproportionately affected by unemployment during COVID-19. Where else might intersectionality apply? In our story on menstrual taboos at the Sabarimala Hindu temple in India, we found that women's socioeconomic background has a significant effect on their likelihood of contracting urogenital infections. The data showed us that poorer women and women with lower education levels tend to use reusable cloth while on their period, while wealthier women could afford to use disposable, disposable pads. Women who use reusable cloths were found to be more likely to contract bacterial, bacterial vaginosis, urinary tract infection, and other serious illnesses. We also did a story on obstacles that Muslim female athletes face due, in their participation of sports at home and on the international level. Here, our story directly addresses the challenges that these women face due to their overlapping identities and values as Muslim sportswomen, and shows, that, and shows us that while women certainly suffer from bias in the sports world, certain groups of women suffer more discrimination. For our next tip, contextualize your data. A simple question to ask ourselves when we look at any data set is, what causes this data to look the way it does? We can use both quantitative and qualitative data to provide context to a particular problem, trend, or phenomenon, and show the depth of lived experience from the people behind the numbers. In our sex trafficking story, as shown in the visualization on the left, we used quantitative development indices such as governance, lack of basic needs, levels of education, and levels of legal discrimination to understand why women in Asia were so vulnerable to being trafficked. And in the visualization on the right, from our story on the silent hepatitis C epidemic in Asia, the data we had showed that marginalized communities were especially vulnerable to contracting hep C and to remaining untreated. But to further understand why and the specific barriers they face, we mapped out the Cox Bazar refugee camp in Bangladesh to reflect the grueling distances that patients have to walk in order to get checked and treated for hep C. 
but sometimes it's not enough to rely on publicly available data or spreadsheets or preconceived notions of what might count as data. We need to expand what we consider as sources of data. Looking beyond traditional ideas of what data is could offer us fresh perspectives and insights on stereotypes and assumptions that we don't know we hold. For example, in our story on beauty pageants, we analyzed the speeches of contestants across countries over a decade to identify patterns in how women would present themselves on one of the world's biggest stages. Going hand in hand with global developments in women's rights and participation in public life, we found that the words contestants would use had evolved as well. Pictured as tiaras, these words had changed from vague descriptions of peace and love to more cause-driven speeches. And in our story on popular Han Chinese names through the decades, as you can see on the right, through historically Chinese characters for names used to include more feminine and masculine traits according to the gender of the individual. But after the 80s, babies began sporting gender neutral radicals with meanings such as water, bird, and green. Even more telling is how daughters received names for the with the radicals for excellent, knowing, and cultured historically reserved for sons, as women's position in society arose with China's modernization. Data can also be present in the mundane. Have you ever thought about how women's pockets are absolutely abysmal at carrying anything more than a set of keys or barely a single phone? Or how much unpaid care work women perform in comparison to men on top of their professional duties? And how many years this comprises out of a woman's life as compared to a man's? No? Well, that's a source of data and pain points for women too. In their story on the difference between pocket sizes in men and women's genes, which we can see on the left, the pudding uncovered a serious gap in clothing design between the two genders. And in a multimedia interactive story by you and women on the right, they show that when it comes to unpaid care work and domestic work, women and men are definitely not in the same boat. And now for our last tool or tip, seek and show no ones through qualitative data, such as anecdotes, interviews, audio, and illustration elements. This multimedia approach was key in our story on the Rohingya refugee crisis at sea. This was originally not a gender-centric story, but we recognized it was important to include women's experiences too. Why? Because the challenges faced by female refugees are vastly different from their male counterparts. More women are vulnerable to sexual violence and are more likely to be exploited in the country of destination. But keep in mind that not all qualitative data is made equal. In development work, Household surveys tend to interview only the male members of the household rather than the women. This is in contrast to the reality that women tend to be responsible for domestic chores and finances. Women also know what's going on, the, on in the ground in the community. They will tell you about a different reality from that of men's. And so how you conduct qualitative data collection should factor in the gender question too. So now that we've shown you our bag of tools, when it comes to constructing stories that show empathy, that consider the difference between the experiences of men and women, how can you apply these tips and tools to your work? And what does this conversation on gender mean for Asia? It means that we simply can't apply, we cannot simply apply rather, Western ideas and applications of gender and development wholesale to the Asian experience and context. The way Asia perceives gender is very different and that should be reflected in how we collect data and how we analyze our data. There are many cultural and religious nuances. Historically, there have been third genders such as the Hitra, gender that is based on the age of the individual, for example, during Edo era Japan, or according to religious systems, such as the Kothoes of Thailand. The ways in which we work to advance gender equality in Asia might take a very different shape from mainstream methods. Now let's extend that idea to data collection analysis and the insights that we can derive from this. In our story on the role of the Sarong, 
which is a traditional wraparound garment worn by both men and women across Asia. We applied a different tactic to exploring the gender dynamics in the use of this cultural artifact. In recent years, the sarong has been appropriated and sexualized by Western fashion and media, as seen in this movie poster. This two-pronged attack on the sarong in popular culture has diminished its historical and symbolic perception in global consciousness. In sharp contrast, women in Asia are using the sarong to resist patriarchal norms today. For example, just this year, women in Myanmar hung their sarongs in the streets during International Women's Day as a protest against the military coup, both playing upon and challenging the idea that men the, tradi that the traditional idea that men lose their masculine essence if they pass under a sarong or any woman's undergarment. So the sarong is not just a beach wrap or a mere item for mass consumption either. And last but not least, in this story on murders committed by women, but committed by women in China by the Community University of China, the data visualizations give context to the different reasons for female homicide and how these must be understood alongside the conflicting pressures of China's economic development, family and village norms, and traditional female roles within the family. The chart, the chart on the top left shows the significant proportions of victims by relationship. Most victims are husbands, followed by children, and then other close family relationships. The chart on the bottom left shows that 70% of women's violent crimes in China occur in townships and rural areas, where traditional ideas that one, women's interests, women's interests are subordinate to the families, and two, internal family conflicts should be kept secret are particularly strong. As such, many women are unable to leave the, leave the family, so domestic conflicts get worse. The chart on the right shows that 80% of female murderers only had up to junior middle school education. Many of them are farmers or are unemployed. When you consider that there's still a large gap in women's education and employment opportunities in rural China, we end up with a picture of economic and psychological dependence, and thus less awareness and ability for them to seek counseling or other forms of help. In this case, context matters greatly because it shows us where the root causes of the problem lie. Only then we can begin to imagine ways to start solving it. To sum it up, we know that gender inequality exists and that women all over the world still face uphill battles in many areas of their lives. Our work has only stressed further that it's time to make women count by including them in this, proce in this process of collecting, understanding, and visualizing data. Involve, involving women from the get-go affects the stories we tell about them and shapes our visions of a gender-inclusive future. Hopefully, these new ways of thinking about data helps us in fixing the systems that have, fa that have failed those outside the default. So we both invite you to apply a gender lens to the everyday and make the invisible visible in your work. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed our presentation and learned something new. If you'd like to see more of Continentalist, head, head over to our website at continentalist.com or subscribe to our newsletter and media page where the team shares the best tips and tricks of data storytelling. And that's all from us. We love to, we'd love to hear more from you. So we've prepared a few roundtable questions so everyone can participate. Please stay on if you'd like to join us. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for making time in your busy schedule to join us today. Um, so I'm hey, thank you. I'm Zafira. And, yeah, yeah, that's Zaf. Um, so before we head over to the roundtable discussion, we'll go over the results of the poll first. Oh, and um, oh, thank you, Emily. You can see your comment. Thanks so much. Um, so I will start by sharing the results. Zaf, let me know when it's visible to you. And let's uh, take a quick look and see what people have said in response to our questions. So first of all, 
Um, okay, so how do you define data? We've got a majority of people who answered that they think data is a resource, which I personally find quite interesting. Um, I believe it was a, a chairman of Tesco who once said the data is like the new oil. And I find it interesting that it seems to be kind of mirrored here in a bit, in a bit of a ways. What do you think, mm -hmm. Zaf? Yeah. Um, also, I think at the start of the, at, when the poll started, most of the votes were going to um, number four, observations to support an agenda. Um, so it would be interesting to hear um, what experiences or, or how people perceive data these days that, you know, makes you think that, um, yeah, data um, ultimately supports an agenda. I would like to hear from the person who actually voted none of the above. There is, um, I think, a few people who, who voted this, and I, I'd like to hear what they think data actually is, if it, basically it's an amalgamation of all of these definitions, or if it's something that really doesn't fall into any of these categories. But again, thank you for your responses. Let's move on to the second question that we asked you in the poll. Um, and please also stick around if you'd like to be part of the roundtable discussion. We invite everyone to share their experiences in handling the question of gender and data. Um, hopefully this poll put you in the right headspace to think about these and your own experiences. So the second question we asked was, what do you as a practitioner perceive to be the main obstacle towards collecting gender data and implementing policies based on it? So majority of the responses fell into the answer of available data does not directly reflect the issues I would like to solve. Huh, okay, that's that's a very interesting, it's a very interesting majority. What do you mm -hmm. think, Zaf? And, and quite similar to, I guess, the challenge we face where um, there's tons of data out there, a lot mm -hmm. of open data, especially in the development field, um, but we're unable to find data that specifically um, helps us tell the stories we want to tell. Um, and these tends to be, you know, stories that are, are a lot of nuance and have all these intersect intersecting elements and tell stories on women. So yeah, I think that's a shared um, challenge we face um, as, as data um, practitioners and also practitioners in the field of development. Um, again, there's uh, some people who answered none of the above uh, like their obstacles in harnessing the de in harnessing data to answer gender questions does not fall into any of these challenges. So I, we'd love to hear from you during the roundtable discussion what those challenges for you have been like, how you've um, addressed them, um, if they're if they remain unsolved. It's definitely something that all of us can um, discuss and that we'd love to learn more about. So let's move on to the third question, which is what kinds of content. Would you like to see more from the media about gender related issues? So the majority answered more data driven reporting. And then I think it was followed by narrative pieces with a gender angle. And lastly, by pieces that explain societal trends and poli policies. So I think this was more of Zafira's question. So Zafira, what do you mm -hmm. think about the results? Um, I mean, th that's good that more people want to, you know, majority want to look uh, Want to want to see more data driven reporting because this is what um, continentalist strives to do. Um, yeah, I'm I'm surprised that um, that that our audience like the least. I think votes go to pieces that explain societal trends and and policies. Uh, maybe yeah, those who voted for that can can explain can explain why. All right, thanks, Safira. Let's move on to our last question. And then after this, for those of you who have the time to stick around, we'll be going into the roundtable discussion. Um, the last question is, does the media or storytelling help you advance the use of gender data in your fields? And an overwhelming majority have answered yes. Um, 26 respondents have answered yes. So that's definitely good that's to good. hear. Okay. That basically is a point in support of what we do in, at Continentalist, and we hope that what we shared today in our presentation will help you in the future, in the near future, or even in your daily life to make a case for why we need gender disaggregated data and even how we can use it effectively. Um, Zaf, do you have any um, comments or thoughts about this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that, that's great that a lot of people think that storytelling um, you know, has something to offer the cause. Uh, but it would be also just interesting to hear that the people who voted no, um, maybe they feel that the media actually undermines um, their work 
in, in a certain way. So that, that would be interesting to hear. All right, thank you, Zaf. So now that we've gone through the poll results, um, let's move on to the roundtable discussion. So just give me a moment for me to start sharing my screen. And then I'd like to invite everyone who will be speaking, who would like to share their experiences to turn on your cameras and turn on your mic. This is a bit more of an open discussion. So um, if you feel like you wanna, you have a point, raise your hand, we'll direct the attention to you. Um, we are very excited to hear what you think. So, yeah, we'd love to hear from um, everyone's experiences. Uh, uh, we know that a lot of uh, people uh, in the audience are working in this space. Um, and uh, even today, the in the in the other knowledge labs, um, a lot of people are doing great work and offering like practical solutions um, to make you know, town planning, transport planning, more gender sensitive. Um, so yeah, we love to hear from people who are actually in the field and on the ground collecting the data um, and crafting policy from data. So yeah, if everyone, anyone would like to share how they've, you know, approached um, their work uh, with a gender lens or they're working um, to collect sex disaggregated data. Yeah, would anyone like to go first? Okay, I can see that Lyra has raised your, her hand. Um, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, absolutely. Hello, hello, Bianchi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, your audio is loud and clear. So thanks for being the first person, <laughs> Lyra. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Lyra. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, I have a, a very positive bias, so if I would, if I may mm -hmm. call it that because I've written a book about women and water. And my frustration while I was doing research was, it was very difficult to find um, data that, would, that I could use for both um, water scarcity, you know, the cross between water scarcity issues and gender equality or um, women's empowerment issues. Well, um, let me make it um, a bit more, um, a bit clearer. So water scarcity would always affect women, especially here in Asia and also in, in Africa, um, mm -hmm. because when there is water shortage, it's us women who would take the brunt, the brunt of um, not having enough water, running water, fresh water in the household is always um, on women's shoulders. So I was um, coming from the perspective where there has to be a way to solve our sustain, uh, to solve the problems related to sustainable development goals and stuff like that, where whereby we could um, have that um, commonality among issues relating to water and women. But I've, um, what I could see, what I have observed rather during um, my data gathering and research process was that. A lot of stuff that you could find, um, you could actually find about water and then a lot of stuff about women, but none that would come, almost none or very little that would combine both. And those that have fun are um, opinionated, highly opinionated. So I think that um, using your data storytelling process is very brilliant. It's really brilliant. I admire the innovation behind it. My only concern is that when we tell stories, mm -hmm. stories usually tend to be added on or, um, or decreased. That, that, you know, it's not that data-driven because people could add um, colors to it because of their opinion, their personal biases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure if, if I've made it clear enough but that has been my experience. So it was very difficult to um, find data that would really support my, my um, um, there were, I had some ideas and then I wanted to find whether these ideas could be shared out there. Maybe other people have already thought about this and, and there, are, there were people I found who had similar ideas. But then on the other hand, um, my other concern was that I was I just having confirmation bias because what I have seen were 
are those stories that I that I that are actually out there, and mm. those stories could may may not may or may not be so data driven as I would have liked them to be. So um, my my question is really about how do we make sure that in using data storytelling, the stories that we tell are uh, more data driven than opinionated. Mm -hmm. So there's no personal biases. Mm -hmm. Our personal own personal biases would always be included into those stories that we tell based on uh, the narrative that we want to confirm. Mm -hmm. So um, Lyra, just if I understand this correctly, your question is about how do we reduce the bias that we might add as individuals like coming in from a certain angle when we use story data storytelling to issues about um, women plus water, water scarcity or other sorts of issues. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you got it right, Bianchi. Thank you so much. That is a really interesting question in, in, in multiple ways, because we did ask this initial question about what people think data is and how a lot of people said that it's a resource, but there was also um, a, a portion that um, said that it was a, it's, it's evidence or maybe basically observations that are used to support an agenda. I, I personally think it's really difficult to remove bias from anything that humans create in general what you create or put out into the world, the way you approach things will always be colored by your own personal experiences, by things that matter to you. It's the same way that issues that matter to women might not matter as much to men, but we know that it takes both, to, both genders to actually make a change because women can't do it alone. What I can say is that when we use storytelling at Continentalist, one thing you may have noticed if you've taken a look at the stories we've produced is that there is always a call to action at the end of the story. We want people to do something with this information rather than just take in the story, look at the visuals and then call it a day. There's always going to be a call to action because at the end of the day, I feel like that's really what data storytelling is about. You want to understand something and then you want to communicate it to other people so that they can take action too about it you're just so that you're not doing it on your own. So how does that link back to this idea about reducing bias? I think it links back to this idea about reducing bias in the sense that you have to contextualize the story that you're trying to say, you're trying to tell, you have to kind of contextualize it in the sense of where you are coming from as the author. So are you coming from the point of view of a development advocate? Are you coming from the point of view of a, of a lay person? Um, because that helps under, other people understand what kinds of ideas you're bringing to the table in areas where you might not have, areas which you might not have had the chance to look at yet. Um, I think it's the same with any data set in general. We cannot look at data sets in a void. We can't look at them devoid of context. There's never really going to be something that's purely objective. What matters at the end of the day is what is our objective? What is our call to action? What is the call to action we want to give other people and how we can use data storytelling to support that call to action so that people actually do something. It's not just a it's not just us talking to a wall, it's, it's us talking to, a, to, a, to an audience and then we have a conversation with them and we actually go and do something about this data that we've collected. Um, Zafira, do you wanna add on to that before we go back to Lyra, I guess? Yeah, I mean, uh, Bianchi said it all, but I definitely agree that, um, you know, you can't be, you can't remove bias uh, all of us have have bias uh, uh, as a writer and, and starting out as a journalist, we were taught to be, you know, objective and neutral. Um, and I soon found out that it's impossible to be objective. Um, um, what we produce will always be colored by, by our biases. But like Bianchi said, um, you know, contextualizing your data, contextualizing your, your keeping context in mind when you carry out your research, um, is, is really important. And we found that, I mean, I found that um, sometimes I approach a topic with my preconceived notions or my, or my certain leanings and then the data set, the data set actually um, unearths something that I didn't expect or something that counters uh, what I perceived was, um, what I perceived was true or what I perceived was accepted. So um, I think diversifying your research, diversifying, looking at diverse data sets and, and covering all ground um, is something that you need to do when obviously you, you, you work on a data story, you work on um, something for the media that, that 
you know, it will be shown to the public um, it, it is hugely important, yeah. All right, Lyra, um, I hope that answered your question or do you have any other points to add in response to that before we move over to Zani who has her hand raised? Hello? Okay, I guess um, maybe she can join us again later. Uh, let's move on to Zani first. Like I saw that Zani raised her hand and then we'll move on to Niti. Yes, no, thank you. Just very briefly, um, that was a fantastic presentation and really appreciated sort of the, the approach that you took to, you know, presenting the issue. I think what was interesting, you know, when you presented, um, uh, one of the things that struck me, many things, but one of the things that struck me was this, uh, when you talked about the uh, how names have evolved in 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 you know in China, and and um, and I was wondering, and it, it is a story about maybe looking at how gender norms have changed or are changing. Mm -hmm. Did you set out to look at that, or was that something that, as Saf was mentioning, was that a finding that you? you kind of came across uh, by accident and then you were able to, you know, see that, you know, there was a um, maybe an interesting story to be told there. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, I guess, you know, as uh, so I've worked as a gender specialist all my life. And one of the things that always frustrates me is that um, we, uh, Data is important, um, but at the same time, we cannot uh, sometimes afford to wait until we have, you know, all the data available for us to start acting, right? So, um, for example, you talked about the femicides in, in Mexico. Um, we knew women were disappearing. We knew that they were being found dead. You know, you didn't, there was, um, you didn't need to have all the data in order to be able to start doing something to address gender-based violence. And so, you know, it's always this, this thing where, you know, as, um, as gender specialists, we, we try to kind of move the, the issue forward um, and sometimes come across as this, uh, come across this question or this wall that says, okay, where's your evidence? And I think it's important to have that. Um, and, and of course, data is what we need. Um, but at the same time, it's not, I guess, it's not everything that we need. And so, um, yeah, so I just wanted to hear your comments on that. So thank you, Zani, for your thoughts. Um, and maybe I could comment first on the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, Han Chinese name story, and then Zafira, you can comment on the second question that Zani had. So for the Han Chinese name story, the question was, uh, well, the story itself was by Isabella Trua, who is one of the right senior, a senior writer at Continentalist. And when we asked her about the story, uh, what she shared with us was that, well, that these findings about how the perceptions of women have changed over, over time and how this has shown in the names that parents use to, well, use to name their daughters, it's actually something she came across from the analysis. She kept the co initial question quite open when she did her initial dive into the data. Um, the general question she asked was, what can we tell from the evolution of Han Chinese names? It wasn't have perceptions about women changed or what kinds of, uh, mas of masculine names are being given to boys and girls. It wasn't something that was directed. So I think that that's something that we try to do at Continentalist more and more so often these days is that we try to keep the question very, the initial question very open. We have an idea of what we'd like to see, but we also don't let that be the end all be all. We let the data drive the shape of the story. So the Han Chinese names was one example of that. If I could also point your attention to our story on sex trafficking, what we used was this um, in data set from the Global uh, Anti-Trafficking Collaborative, and it, it lists both male and female data from a variety of countries. So what we did there was we had an initial question about like who is getting trafficked. And then we later on realized that majority of it is actually women and girls and that they come from very specific countries. So that's another way in we've, which we've kind of kept the initial question open and then we let the data drive the rest of the shape of the story because you can have an idea in mind 
but the data itself might not be able to substantiate it. And I, I see from some of the um, answers in the chat as well from Charmaine and Cecilia that they also apply triangulation of data to their work to kind of um, support the conclusions that they draw. It's not just one source saying that this is actually the case, it's multiple sources. And even though you are using data storytelling to drive your agenda or to produce your call to action, what other people can see looking at your research is that you've looked at it from multiple angles. So that I think also helps drive the shape of what we end up producing, the questions that we eventually end up answering in some of these stories, which is what have other sources said? So where can we bring something new to the table or what is something that is emerging? Because when we do data storytelling, when we pull from the research, we don't necessarily just want to regurgitate whatever is already out there. We want to see where things have changed. And in order to do that, we need to have data that substantiates it from multiple sides. We can't exactly control what the answer is going to look like. So I hope that answers your question about the Han Chinese name story. Um, Zafira, do you want to answer Zoni's second question? Yeah, um, on, on the second uh, question, definitely. I mean, data takes um, a lot of time and effort to collect. Uh, and, you know, with really pressing issues, um, you know, action has to be taken. There's no time to wait for um, the data, you know, to show you all the evidence. Uh, you can, there's no time. You can't just wait for the data and then, okay, now we're going to introduce uh, a policy or a law, sadly. Um, and, and in the case of, I mean, unfortunately, in the case of like the femicides in Mexico uh, and sexual violence in Singapore, um, you know, data on, you know, this really persistent um, issues affecting women were collected only recently. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, you read those stories and you're like, why is this only being discussed now? Or why, why is the data only, why are people only collecting the data now when women, um, um, have suffered uh, from all these, uh, you know, issues for so long. Um, and I think that's why um, at Continentalist, storytelling is, you know, like half of what we do. We do, we work with data and then we tell stories. It, it forms a huge bulk. Uh, it, it is our approach um, to the field of data. Um, I think with, with storytelling, it, it helps um, bring data beyond the point of just um, numbers or, or evidence, but it also stirs conversation. It stirs um, emotion uh, in, in the in the reader or the receiver um, of of the piece, um, and it generates. It has the potential to generate generate further action um, beyond just looking at you know this is what the data shows. Um, and as Bianchi mentioned before, we we uh, typically include a call to action. Um, you know, at the end of our piece to, to spur people to sort of think about these issues in their own communities, in their own societies, and, and if they want to act uh, or if they want to learn more, they can, um, you know, reach out to people who are working in this field or support NGOs. Um, so, yeah, I think what we do at Continentalist, we try to expand, we, we try to um, take data out of a silo or a niche and bring it to more people um, and hope that with that, you know, more people are, are I guess, motivated to, to take action and, and sort of change things or, or become more sensitive to things um, in their daily life. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, um, Zoni, do you have anything else to add to that? I guess we gave our responses, any, any thoughts? about it. Oh, I think she's clicked yes, that it answered the question. Is that right, Sonny? Yes. yes. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's move over to Niti. It, am I pronouncing that right? If you could turn on your camera. Yeah, and your that's, office. that's, that's the right uh, pronunciation. Thanks. Uh, firstly, let me congratulate you on a great presentation. It was thank super you. interesting. Uh, so thanks so much for that. Um, my question is actually related to what Zephira was just saying, you know, uh, data driven storytelling can be so powerful, it can stir emotions. Uh, and especially when you're talking about uh, in the field of gender advocacy and persuasion is so important. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, what are the features of a good 
you know, data driven story yeah. uh, in, in a world where attention spans are, are going down and there's so much information. Um, what in your experience you, you see in work um, and when we produce, you know, we, we, we try to produce such stories, what do you think um, works best? Yeah. Wow, that's a really hard question, Zafira. Yeah, yeah what, what? We're, you know, we're, it's a constant, it's a, it's a, we're still in the process of, all, we're always figuring out what works best, um, what appeals to people. Um, um, but I think with data, data viz, um, and even with, if, with writing, um, what people, it, it should be, it should be always be simple, like simply understood um digestible um straightforward it should obviously have um if a, if a, if if the if the viz is you know beautifully done or you know pretty and th that's that's great because that immediately captures the attention but i think what will leave an impact and get people thinking is if the information in that viz is you know immediately um understood um yeah, with with short attention spans, no one no one really has the, you know, time to you know unpack like a like a hugely complicated story or viz. Um, but yeah, it's something we we all. This question is something that we always think about when we're producing the database, when we're ideating, um, when we're coming up with the story angle. Um, what will attract attention and what will stick? Yeah. Yeah, um, I echo Zafira's um, point in that regard. Uh, I, but I come from it, I guess, from the perspective of a, de of a designer, a data viz designer, and this may get a little technical. I'll try to explain everything as best as I can. So in the data visualization field, there is fast data viz, and then there is slow data viz. What's the difference? Fast data viz is something you can understand at a glance. You don't need to engage with the data visualization as much in order to understand it. Slow data viz, it leans towards this form of art almost. You can appreciate it as an art form, as a painting maybe, or as a drawing, but it may take some time in order for you to understand what's going on in this data visualization. Both have their purposes. In continentalist, I guess, depending on the kind of story, we may lean more towards one or the other. We try to meet the we try to meet both conditions. We try to make our data visualizations a marriage of both this concept of fast and slow in that you can get what we're trying to say right away, how it supports the story. But if you take the time to understand what's going on in this data visualization, then you may also uncover interesting nuggets of information or patterns that you yourself find. And again, as I said, I think it's a really hard question, but when I answer it from the point of view of a designer, everything you put in a story or everything you put in a visualization or a simple chart you show to your boss or to your friends, it has to serve a purpose. There has to be a purpose. Um, there has to be a reason why the colors you choose are the colors you choose. Um, there is a thematic purpose, for example, to why we choose certain colors for our story on the Rohingya refugee crisis. We chose a very somber color palette. We chose more light-hearted color palettes for the for the story on beauty pageants, for example. So everything you choose to put in your story or in your singular data visualization has to have a reason for why you're doing that. And that reason is usually what people make assumptions about. One example I can give off the top of my head is how we assume anything that is colored green, maybe in most mainstream cultures, anything that's colored green is good. And then anything that's colored red is bad. So being thoughtful about the use of colors is already one way in which to kind of immerse people in the story that you're telling, because if they get confused about the elements you're using to tell your story, then that disengages them. And um, that's also one of the tools that we really rely on, which is this idea of like psychology, what do people think, like what do people think intuitively will represent something? I feel like that is very crucial to creating um, a good data story from, well, a data viz designer's perspective. And I think Zafira has already shared a lot with how, like from the storytelling side, from the writer's side, how you can produce a good data story. Um, I hope that answered your question, Niti, but if you have any other yes. points to add, feel free to voice them. No, this is great. Thank you both. Yeah, thank, thank you. you as well. Thanks for your thank question. You.
I see that um, Lyra is raising hey. her hand again. Lyra, uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining yeah, us again. Hi. Yes. Uh, if yeah, um, I, I was um, I had some connection problems. Okay. Um, oh no. Okay. If I may just add to the question about about um, uh, short attention span. Yeah. Sure. What we have um, um, what we have seen worked is that if you have three things: a compelling story that um, your your target um, audience can easily relate to. Yeah. And then accessible language, usually short sentences, you know, um, in, in um, plain English. Mm -hmm. And then more images, if you're, if you're using um, PowerPoint presentation or slides and all that, uh, more images and less words. We, we've seen that really worked. Um, I've seen um, some of your stories and, and they're really, the way you, you've um, crafted um, how the story uh, flows, um, they're really impactful and um, very compelling. So um, I think that one would work. Well, the irony behind short attention span is that when it's something educational, you attempt to educate people. People tend to have short attention span, but um, it's, it's also like um, qu quite ironical in the sense that a 400 page novel, for example, could still sell or... Um, you know, you must have watched that movie, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. So um, <laughs> why did that book sell? So you can imagine like, okay, people are having really short attention span. You can't even talk to them for like 30 minutes and then they would just go back to their phone. They'd be on their phone, they'd be on their screen and all that. But then a movie or, or, or something, um, a book like Fifty Shades of Grey really made it big. It became a bestseller or something like that. So what was in it? that made it sell. So it's because it touched um, a core in a lot of women. So, so things like that, like if you would be telling a story that would really hit the core, um, regardless of, um, you know, people would, might increase or expand their attention, um, their attention towards you or to what you're saying, because they would look forward to the insights that they can learn. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I have observed um, in, in, in my experience, in my practice. Um, just a, so I would want to relate that into um, an issue on gender disaggregation, because mm -hmm. I've seen how it has been practiced in, in, in two organizations I've worked with. So gender disaggregation, um, a topic that would be um, mm -hmm. like there's an event and then um, one organization I've worked with although the event was not really meant for a certain kind, for a certain group of people but because they needed to hit that a gender disaggregation quota or, or kpi or something so that mm -hmm. means there has to be a balance between men and uh, male and female participants then it just pulled out oh, whoever from other departments just so they could fill that they could comply mm -hmm. with that requirement mm -hmm. and that so of course, you would agree that that's not really effective. What in your practice um, have you actually observed? Like, what could work when it comes to gender disaggregation, disaggregated data, um, especially when it relates to um, the need to educate people? So, if it is something that is um, geared towards the need for men to understand how women think. How do you comply with the gender disaggregation requirements? There are a lot of great points that Lyra has raised, and I think she actually summarized some of the things that we wanted to, to share about what makes a good data story. Um, if I could summarize the, well, the really nice insights that Lyra has, has well, basically shared with us that she, she's based upon her work, then yeah, we definitely agree that there are a few very clear things that make good data stories. So one is that it needs to resonate with the audience that you have in mind or even with people beyond that. And in order for a data story to achieve that, it needs to resonate with the real experiences and needs to be easily related to, which is why you see some of the examples that we featured in our presentation. They looked at things that you could consider quite innocuous or very day-to-day -day or even very quotidian. It's, it's just something you encounter every day. Like for example, the size of, of pockets in women's jeans but it's an actual issue because the size of these pockets are abysmal. Why are they abysmal? 
and how is that how is that affecting women day to day um and so obviously that's one example but there are others um crime rates um access to health care menstruation menopause childbirth breastfeeding these are well everyday issues for women so these are things that people can relate to because of personal experience um the second point about what a data good data story should have that kind of reflects what Lyra has said is how it delivers a surprise or an insight. People look forward to being surprised. People look forward to twists and stories. So that's how you can kind of engage your audience and um, keep them interested in what it is you're presenting. I, I do think that yes, people do have well short attention spans, but it also depends on the question of have you hooked them enough to warrant them giving you your giving you their full attention. It's really a question of do they think that this is worth their time and at continentalist we really try to do that with the way we we design and we plan our stories we want to make it worth your time to spend these 10 minutes like going through the story and understanding what the situation is and playing around with the data viz and interacting with it and um in that regard the the onus is always on the creator the author the person preparing the slides it's always it's is usually on them to kind of necessitate to, to kind of make that that bargain with the audience or the user about about my my presentation or what I'm about to show you is worth your attention. Let me prove to you why. So again, needs to deliver insight, surprise or insight, resonates with real experiences or easily related to two components of a good data story. The third one is about showing, not telling. And Lyra has definitely voiced that, you know, don't use too many words use a lot more pictures, but also be careful with what pictures you use. One thing that we encountered when we were making the slides for this presentation is that sometimes we had too many pictures on one slide because we wanted to feature all these great examples of how people are using gendered data in order to solve a problem or to raise awareness about something. And um, our designer, Amanda, who would, I would like to give a lot of credit for creating these beautiful slides, um, really had to sit us down and tell us uh, one picture at a time or at, at most two when you want to make a point that is contrasted against one another. So that's one data storytelling or even just a presentation tip, I guess. When you want to convince people, be careful of what you're show, be, be mindful of what you're trying to show them. Be purposeful with what you're trying to show them. Um, keep in mind that people can only really focus on one thing at a time. And maybe the point you're trying to make is contrast the point you're trying to make is a very specific example so maybe just show one picture or just a few pictures that illustrate one or two points so yeah in summary like it really just all links back to what lyra has has shared from her own experience that good data stories resonate with real experiences you can relate to them they deliver surprise or insight and they show they don't just tell you what you're supposed to see um yeah so zafira do you want to add on to that and what else Lyra has said, and then we'll move I, on to Charlotte. Yeah, uh, on your second question, that's that's a great, that's a really great question, actually. Um, yeah, I think that um, it's, yeah, it's not, it's obviously not great when um, people, or when, you know, people are just trying to hit, a, a people are just collecting sex disaggregated data to uh, meet a quota or, uh, working on women's issues uh, to meet a, a, an ESG goal, um, and we, we definitely see that happening a lot in the in in business. Um, um, but I think that, and this is why I think that um, it's important. This is again where data, where storytelling comes in, where we have um, the ability to to shape the narrative. Um, for example, we're doing a story, right? We, me and Bianchi are working on a story right now um, in collaboration with She Loves Tech, uh, which focuses on uh, women that women's led businesses and how and looks at the challenges that women face in entering the tech startup industry. Um, and you know, research is showing that there's a lot of interest in femtech. Um, a lot of there's a lot of gender lens invest in, investments coming in, and we see also a lot of um, men entering the industry and and seeking. Uh, gender lens investment funds and 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 you know me pasting the word like em women's empowerment um you know on their on their mission statement and and you know um you know saying something uh, uh, having some sort of impact on women um but what our story um or at least what we're trying to strive with this story is to sort of un uncover or, or explore 
and 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 show what empowerment actually means. What does it mean for um, a woman? What empowers women? What do women want? What, what do women actually need? Um, how? What does real impact look like? Um, and we do this uh, through, you know, weaving in qualitative elements. For example, um, in the story, we'll be featuring profiles of five of the women founders. Um, and you know, weaving in their experiences with entering the tech industry and the challenges they faced, and um, what I guess what success looks like to them, and what they think that women really need in their in their own industries. Um, so I think it's important for the narrative to place to uplift to continue to uplift the voices of women um, and sort of not focus too much on, on just the numbers where people are hitting the ESG marks and meeting quotas. Um, and that's why it's important to always contextualize um, the, the numbers that you have, the data, and not just take it at face value. I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, great insight. And this is a really great learning experience. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I think Charmaine has a question. Yeah, let's move on to Charmaine. Hi. Um, just a super quick um, question. But you guys have already covered a lot of the, you know, gathering data, um, making it into a story. But I guess my question is more on the next steps. Like after you've done all of this, you've um, created a really nice data-driven story. Um, how do you use that to kind of influence policy in a way or how do you uh, influencing policy is like pretty um pretty big but i guess in a more practical sense how do you distribute it or how do you make sure that you know this thing this great thing that you've created will actually be put into good use by um the actual people who needs to read it or who needs to see it Hmm. Hmm. That is a really interesting question, Charmaine. Give us a moment to think about it, because I think yeah. Katie also also yeah, just, asked a question about that in a similar yeah. vein. Just to give a context on how I came across Continentalist. So I'm also working in. I'm I'm a comms person, um, and in one of your stories, I think you did something um, in the Mekong region. Um, mm -hmm. And we found it on Twitter. And then um, in, in, we wanted to kind of and share it because it's great. So in, in, in our um, sharing, we tagged, um, you know, some of the um, ministry people that we worked with and all of that. But, but that's like, that's just social media. But so I want, I'm, I'm wondering if there are actual steps that you guys um, take when it comes to like sharing your products or your stories um, so that people see all of this superb work. Mm. So I guess it, it's something that we've been doing from the beginning when we started partnering up with other organizations who are interested in the same topic. The thing is, if your work never gets seen, then who can you affect? Who can you touch, right? Who can you, who can you reach? It's, it's really a question of how far your reach goes right now, I guess. Um, so Charmaine, thank you for asking this question. I think it's something we've been wondering about as well. Um, so that's why we have social media. Definitely, because it lets us share what we're doing with other people and hopefully the people who are interested in it or even just lightly interested in it need a little bit of a push can find what we're doing and, you know, resonate with it and do something about it when given the call to action. Um, we use a lot of hashtags on social media. We research what hashtags to use. Definitely. That's one thing we've really been looking at. Um, we work with the organizations who are likewise invested in a topic. So one example of that is obviously what we're doing with She Loves Tech. We want to bring attention to the challenges that women face in the startup scene, why there still seems to be this glass ceiling that they can't break through. 
And um, what She Loves Tech is doing is, is, is helping us connect with, the, um, with some of these women founders. They're giving us insights into the data that they've produced. And they're also going to help us share what we produce with this in this story. So um, using the dual communities, I guess, of the organization that we're working with and the people who follow Continentalist for any sort of content that Continentalist produces, we're able to reach more people. Um, so that's that's one way to answer it. Um, I guess about the policy making, Zafira, do you have any thoughts about these 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 questions? I guess. Yeah, um, that's a tough question. We hope that um, obviously we hope that our stories reach. I mean, reach the public, uh, reach like mainstream readership, um, and even better if it it gets to the policy level or it's able to if you know affect. Um, action um, um, in, 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 in policy. Um, yeah, that's really tough. Uh, but something we, we've done is, um, I'll just mention again, in our, in our call to action, we do uh, encourage, I mean, if people are, are concerned or interested in this cause to you know, to look for further ways to, to get involved or seek more information or even write to um, their government official um, or write to the NGO and volunteer with the NGO, especially with our um, partnership stories. Uh, we've done partnership stories with um, UNHCR, um, Open Development Mekong, um, Women Un Unbounded. Um, we've done a few stories also on climate change uh, and some you know, infographics on, on social media and, and we always include a link to, you know, um, for to, to, we always link people up with further resources and, and um, you know, if this really, you know, concerns you, we should, we, you know, we need to take action. Uh, we should be writing to the government to take further action. So we, we do encourage a lot of um, action in the public. And I guess we hope that also that, that it sort of has a ripple effect and more people will care and it'll reach um, the attention at the policy level. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. that's one of our goals, yeah. I, I kind of want to tie two things into this, Charmaine, and I hope they also help um, further the discussion on what you asked, because I think that's really the audience we're talking to. Like, how do I convert what I've learned from my data and gender analyses into policy? Um, the first thing I would actually say is, let's caveat this by saying that the people at Continentalist, like our team, we're, we're, we're not policymakers. Um, we are people who are enthusiastic about data and storytelling. And that's particularly why we work with organizations who know more about what is happening on the ground in these particular issues, in agriculture, in gender, in um, anti-trafficking efforts, in, in startups, improving, in, uh, improving equality. Um, to know more about what's happening so but at the end of the day we cannot prescribe anything what we can do however is to focus it on the intent on the agenda of what we want to communicate and to look for gaps and blind spots what we offer is an analysis and a boiling down of the subject in a way that even hopefully a lay person can understand so that they feel compelled to take action to write to their local officials to do something about it to start a movement even maybe so we seek not to confirm bias, but to challenge biases if possible. And I hope that that's something that we've been able to do in this talk, which is to, con to show to you that there are certain biases that should be challenged. What we're doing is we're just one voice among many. And I really think back to this um, point that our co-founder and head paying raised about how she doesn't aspire to change the world, but just to touch and affect one person's perspective of how things are to challenge that person's bias and to challenge how this person thinks of the world in ways that they should be challenged. And maybe that will have a ripple effect. That's that's all we can do as individuals. And that's all we can do as a team, which is hope and, and also work with other organizations to reach people and to, to communicate to those that have the power to change policy, to implement policy, what people actually need on the ground, what the data is saying, what has been supported by different sets of data. So yeah, I, I guess that's that's something to cap off Charmaine's question. If she has any other further insights into that, or any points she wants to raise, or did we we answer it? <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, it it it. I I just wanted to um see how the process is, and 
I think it's a very important thing to um, think about, like after we've done all of this, how do we amplify the message? So thank you guys. This is a very um, insightful talk. Um, I'm happy I, I joined the session. That's great. That's great to hear. <laughs> so I see that there is a question from a you. I'll read it out loud for the benefit of everyone else. Um, I think we're at 6.15 now, so I guess we'll take about maybe one or two more questions and then we'll end the session. So AU is asking, um, even the storytelling approach could be twisted by vested interests. How do you ensure that your product is used in alignment with your advocacy? I'm assuming there is an agenda from your end. Hmm. How do we do that, Safira? <laughs> um... Yeah, agenda. You know, yeah, agenda is a strong word, but yeah, everyone has an agenda. Or everyone has a yeah. has a mission. Uh, at Continentalist, um, you know, we we've made it our mission to, um, you know, support uh, the causes that that we we believe in, and we've we've identified some of the the issues that we as a team care about, um, and that is why we we've written uh, more stories. Um, on you know human rights and, and social causes and climate change, um, so yeah, we we definitely approach um, approach these stories with the intention to um, uplift the voices of you know marginalized communities um, and and give and shed attention on, on issues that might be underreported uh, or might be um, you know underrepresented. Um, are misperceived in in the Western media. So we do have that mission in mind when we when we work on our stories. Um, but yeah, uh, even uh, even with 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 that, um, there is the possibility that you know um, someone might uh, might might see our story and also use. Um, use certain parts of the story to fit their own agenda. There's always the possibility um, of that. Uh, one example was the story uh, we did with UNHCR. Um, you know, the refugee crisis is a really sensitive topic um, in, in Southeast Asia. And um, our partner and ourselves were worried that um, people would, you know, just, you know, take one viz out of the story and, and spread it to, to relay a different message. Or or, or um, just promote a message that that we didn't align with, uh, and because of that we uh, we adapted the viz, we changed it up a bit so that it would lessen the possibility of someone um, misusing that specific viz. Um, so yeah, there's you know everyone comes with an agenda, but I think for seeing this and being clear with with our intention and following through with our intention. Um, is important and something that we think about throughout the whole process. Um, I would say we're, we're as the team, we're not, uh, we're, we're, I would say that we, we always keep things open throughout the whole ideation process and producing the phase. We're always like open to, to counter, to things that counter our biases or, or, or counter our preconceived notions. Uh, and that keeps things, I guess, more, more balanced, more nuanced, while also allowing us to stick to our beliefs and, and, and the core um, of our mission of, of supporting this, these causes. Yeah, I hope that is, is in a substantial response to, to that comment. Yeah, um, AU, um, any, any points about that, I guess? Uh, if I may. Um, actually, what I, I'm looking at your um, story on the Singaporean sexual assault, uh, by simply using the, the visual, you can actually create a storyline using the same visual and create a storyline that will uh, encourage uh, women to be less mobile, be more protected, and that won't work for gender equity at all. That, that's my concern. Although I saw that you have mentioned um, some action points, some recommendations, which is good. But then uh, from the visual alone, 
there could be a different story that could be capitalized on. And I've seen that happen a lot. You know, they truncate your presentation and use one aspect of it and then spin it a different way. Are there safeguards that you undertake to avoid that? I guess the, the best safeguard against that is really to consider the story in its entirety. It's, it's something that we really advocate for, especially in this presentation, which is that you should consider the context of what you're reading. As we see with the deluge of fake news and fake everything and deep fakes and whatnot, um, when we consider these things out of context, when we don't consider who is producing them and what agenda they might have, that's when it gets very dangerous. Humans are very good at putting their own spin on things, on twisting, or maybe even just like manipulating certain pieces of data to promote whatever it is they want to promote. And that's why we already said at the start of the talk, I guess, that well, we made that caveat that, you know, it's it's not the truth. It's not necessarily objective. It's usually observations you use to promote something that you think should be promoted. Um, two points about that, I guess. It, it always goes back to the to to, to basic to basic understanding and knowledge of data literacy. That that's one thing that I think that we at Continentalists are trying to promote more of, which is like um, being critical of the charts and the graphs that you that you view on social media and whatnot, and understanding the context behind the data that is used to power this chart, the graph, and um, yeah. The second one is really to consider the context again, like always consider context when you are digesting media consider who is producing that particular chart or graphic or story consider what it could mean in terms of it standing alone consider the intent of the designer is it meant to stand alone or is it meant to be consumed as part of a story it, it's really something that we don't have control over it's a question that many people have which is how do we kind of combat combat this this twisting of the narrative misinformation we don't really think we, we don't think that anyone has a good answer to this yet. Um, I, I'd actually like to reply to a point by um, there is another point, I guess, by Kathy that sort of folds into that. Um, algorithms of social media have clearly proven to be dangerous, as we've seen, and even governments face this issue, which is why across the world they're enacting legislation on a worldwide basis to combat this. And admittedly, yes, we 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 admit that we're limited by these algorithms, but in a way, what we're trying to do is we're giving people another tool in their arsenal so that they can make their arguments supported by data and visualizations that are well designed, that hook you in, that provoke your thought process, and that keep you engaged. So um, it's it's I don't think it's a it's a problem that we have a definite solution to yet. It's something that I encourage everyone to think about even when they leave this talk, which is how do we use that sort of um, thinking to improve the discussions around gender and data? Because we know that we can kind of play around with what we observe, right? To tell our own stories. Yeah, Zafira, any points to add to that? Yeah. Thank you, thank um, you. That's a very yeah, no. yeah, no, I think you summed it up. Uh, you summed it up uh, perfectly. It's something obviously that uh, we cannot control. Uh, but that more people are paying attention to right now. And that's why there's a lot of um, uh, work on data literacy and just educating people on um, the use of data um, and, and how to, to digest data. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a work in progress. Uh, and we, we only hope that, uh, like Bianchi said, um, we provide people with just another tool um, in their arsenal. Yeah. Um, so, yep, thanks, Safira. I uh, hope that 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 addressed your point. I guess we just like to briefly touch on Helmi's um, on Helmi's uh, point about how data can be trusted if it's if it's not done research face to face. If, if we can't do research face to face um, from your view, can we trust this and believe 100 percent if we make a research buy through online? So, um, Helmi, do you want to share a bit more about what you mean by this? Sorry, by this question. If Helmi is still in the audience. Um, so I guess Helmi might not be in the audience anymore, but um, yeah, Zafir, do you have any ideas about this? Um, so he's, his question is, can we trust, I guess, research that is made online? Um, I, I guess, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it's sort of related to the previous comments we've made on, um, you know, we can't just, there's a lot of misinformation um, and I guess a lot of, a lot of, just a lot of information online and it, it would be, it's difficult for anyone to sort of sift through and, and, and um, decide, you know, what can be trusted, um, what, what, what can we use from, from this particular body of research. Um, yeah, I think it just relates to more, you know, literacy and how we absorb and understand information, how we filter and sift through the mass of information that is available online. Um, I think, uh, yeah, COVID has definitely prevented um, a lot of us working um, in the field, um, you know, of collecting information and doing face-to-face -face interviews and doing surveys. Um, but I'm sure, uh, yeah, I guess we don't work in the, like we're not actually on the field of data collection, like on the ground. We, we don't do a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, research uh, at Continentalists, um, but I'm sure that uh, with COVID, a lot of uh, people in the field, field are coming up with ways to um, circumvent this problem. Um, if, if anyone, I guess, could share a solution or solutions that are underway to combat this. Yeah, we, we'd like to hear from the audience. Has there been a way that you've kind of worked around this limitation you know, before we close the session? Okay, I can see from Zoni that we need to wrap up real quick. So hmm, that's it's a hard question. I, I don't think we necessarily yes, have a, the answer to that. It's a hard question and it's something that uh, we also keep in mind and we fear. Um, we don't trust obviously everything we find online, all the data sets that we find online, we don't take them at face value. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing, but I think what's important is to be aware that um, not everything that, you shouldn't trust everything you read or, or um, check in online, yeah. Again, I guess I circle around to this point I've been repeating again and again, which is to consider the context of who is producing yeah. this particular information. What is their agenda? How did they collect the data? Unfortunately, it puts a lot more onus on you as the reader to kind of pick up the pieces um, and, and make sense of it. But that's really part of how we live today, which is we are bombarded with information and we need to make sense of things before we do take any action on them. Um, so I guess, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you so much. For, for staying till the end. Thank you to those who stayed till the end. I yeah. guess if you would like to, um, if you would like to reach out to us for further discussion, or maybe you have questions or you wanna work with us, you can find us yeah, here at the media, media handles. Yeah. Um, if there are questions that you had or any points that you had that we weren't able to address in this discussion, we, we definitely encourage you to reach out. Um, I mm -hmm. hope that at the very least that you all learned something new today and that you'll take it back with you to your mm -hmm. own professional fields and that in some way that this has pushed you or touched you to do a bit more in terms of communicating with other people through data and, and focusing on questions about gender. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Have you for evening. joining us. We learned a lot from everyone as well. Thank you.